Um, so hello everybody and thanks for coming along to our webinar this morning. Um, it's our first one that we're done of 2023 so we're a little bit slow off the mark this year considering it's March already but we've got an absolute corker for you today that we, is going to leave you with loads of new ideas for your SEO strategy. So your speakers today are Jess, Nick and Emma. Um, who are also some of the authors of the new deep dive SEO reports that form our updated Super Chump charity benchmark. That's not very easy to say, but Emma's going to tell you more about that um, in a little bit. Oh, I've got a cat running up my leg as well. Sorry. Um, and also then Nick and Jess will be running through other key SEO updates that you need to be aware of right now. Um, we feel it's really important to investigate and share trends in SEO across the whole of the sector. Um, and then we can highlight opportunities where you can improve um, because sharing this information helps all nonprofits to better meet their users' needs through search. However, you'll see from the agenda that we are not covering AI and SEO in this particular event, and that will form a webinar of its own in the future. So keep an eye out for that one. And in terms of housekeeping, um, this is a webinar, so you can see us but we can't see you, but we would love it to be interactive. Um, so please use the chat and the Q&A facility for all of your juicy questions. Um, and we're going to answer a couple of them possibly throughout the event, but we've got quite a lot to get through. So Emma will be answering them on the chat, and then we're going to save some to answer live at the end. Um, I am recording the session as well so that I can share it with you all afterwards. And I've enabled live transcript. So if you need a live transcript, you should be able to um, select that from the options at the bottom of Zoom. And that is it from me. So I'm going to hand over to Emma. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everybody. This is exciting, isn't it, for a Wednesday morning? Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so one of the reasons why we're here today is that we want to mark the relaunch of SEO Super Trumps. Um, but what is SEO Super Trumps? Um, well, in 2021, some of you will be aware, but some of you might not be, um, we launched an analysis of over 50 charity websites across eight subsectors to benchmark SEO performance um, across the nonprofit space. And the idea was really simple. It was using a format that people know and love. Um, super trumps, though, super trumps. Um, and the idea was simple. Um, we highlight the potential opportunities for charities to draw attention to why the winners are winning when it comes to organic search performance. So you can play SEO Super Trumps online, comparing charities overall or by subsector. And once you've dealt the cards um, in our online card game, you can then dig into our sector reports, which provide a lot more in-depth analysis and some SEO Super Tips as well. And we're really excited to be bringing SEO Super Trumps back this year, 2023. And we've expanded the original research to now include 73 nonprofits in total and four brand new subsectors. So these subsectors that we've added uh, for 2023 are disability, homelessness, arts and culture, um, and violence against women and girls. And they, these are in addition to the eight subsectors that we've previously covered. And we felt these added variety and unique value to the Super Trumps project overall. And the range within these subsectors is vast. So you'll be able to see on the screen there the charities that we've added um, for this year. And we've got things like arts and culture sector that aims to engage more people in the arts, all the way through to balance against women and, women and girls, which provides really vital support for people, uh, for women in crisis. But what they all have in common is that their beneficiaries and the organisations themselves are operating in a really difficult landscape. And this is true of all of the 73 nonprofits included in Super Trumps. So in the UK right now, the cost of living crisis, post-COVID life, conflict across the world are all making a huge difference to the way that our audiences are behaving and interacting with our services. Nonprofits operating in 2023 are needed more than ever. Um, and so our, our webinar today is really focused on information and SEO tips that factor that in, that factor in that current landscape. So that includes maintaining buy-in for SEO when budgets are tight, getting SEO value out of the work that you're already doing, and whether or not you should be creating content um, specifically about the cost of living crisis. But first, before we get into that, um, let me talk you through some of the themes from our four new sectors. <clears throat> so the first one is Google is often a first, first touch point for people accessing your advice and services. Um, 
So SEO should really be a core consideration um, for information and service pages. So this might be specific services such as helplines, chat, forum, advocacy service services, that kind of thing. We investigated helplines in the Violence Against Women sector report, where we found that people were searching specifically for different types of helpline based on their experience. Or for many of our charities, a core part of the actual service offering is the information and the advice itself. Um, and informational content hubs is a way of delivering information as widely as possible. So we've seen really great examples of this from Women's Aid, from Rape Crisis, Shelter and Tate. Um, and but content hubs was really a theme across all, all of Super Trumps. So you'll see really good examples of these across all the different subsector reports. The next one is share the stories of real people with lived experience. So this was a theme across a number of sectors, including homelessness, balance against women and disability. And we found that charities were doing a really great job overall of raising the voices of the service users, which was brilliant. But there are multiple SEO benefits to this, um, which includes foreground. So foreground in the stories of real people. Um, is really important because Google actually wants you to demonstrate experience. Um, and this is a new thing uh, back from December 2022. And Jess is going to talk to you about that in a bit more detail shortly. But it's also because people actively search for real life stories. And we found that St. Mungo's, Centerpoint, Womankind Worldwide, and also National Autistic Society were all really good examples of this, either through real story sections or through sort of quotes um, within the content itself. And then the next one is making your information accessible as accessible as possible. And this is really relevant for all charities and really all websites. Um, but there were some really great examples of accessibility best practice um, within the Super Trump's um, work. We particularly highlighted the National Statistics Society and the Disability Report. But there are opportunities to improve as well. The intersection between SEO and accessibility is something that we're really, really keen to advocate. It's almost always the case that what is good for accessibility is good for users and therefore is good for SEO. We've also, though, in this section, explored cognitive load. Um, and I'm sure many of us will have experienced trying to Google information or get a quick answer when under stress or in difficult circumstances. And that context is highly relevant for some, some of the subsectors in particular, for example, homelessness and violence against women. So making your website easy to understand, scan quickly and with clear information that people who are experiencing sort of high stress situations can navigate really easily will make the advice more accessible to those who need it most. And the next one is your site should be easy to use for all, especially on mobile. And I've said easy to use here, but ideally the site should be enjoyable to use. So especially, this is especially relevant if you are driving something like ticket or admission sales. So for example, in the arts and culture sector. So making it as easy as possible for people to use your site will, will drive conversions. We all know what it's like to be on an, an annoying website and you're trying to check out or sign up and it's really hard to do, especially if you're on your mobile phone. So those conversions might be purchases, fundraising or event signups, donations. And really what you're looking to do is make sure that your site is fast, the sign up experience is slick and that you have a really robust internal search function if it's needed or if it's relevant for your organisation. And we found that BFI, National Gallery and Art Fund all performed really well for site performance and Google's core web vitals. Um, and Art Fund's internal search was called out within the reports as a really good example as well. We also want to make sure that the site is optimized for mobile and works really well on slower internet connections. For This is relevant for those who might be accessing your site through public or less re re like reliable Wi-Fi connections, and um, just making sure that everybody can access your site, whatever their circumstances. The next one is local search. So prioritizing local SEO if you have physical locations. Um, local search is crucial for a good user experience and it's often overlooked. Um, and this is important for people who are looking for support locally. And really local search should be being considered alongside your more national focused content, which generally does take precedent for a lot of organizations. So if you have shelters, museums, local groups, care centres, charity shops, basically any building that you want people to go to, you should be considering local SEO. And that includes setting up and optimising your Google's map pack and ensuring that the information is up to date for people who are actually trying to find your buildings. 
And this was particularly relevant for homelessness because many of the top performing keywords within the sector included location-based terms within the actual query. So people were searching things like near me or including a town name, um, for example, homeless shelter near me. And we found that crisis's skylight centers were a really good example for optimizing for local search. So we've pulled out homelessness here, but as I say, it's really relevant for any charities uh, with buildings that you'd like people to go to. And lastly, don't just advocate and educate, but also entertain. So the scope for sort of entertaining and informational content in arts and culture is really the widest of all of our sectors that we've added this year. Um, but entertaining content could also be relevant in other sectors. Um, examples of that might be something like animal welfare or environment, like everybody loves a cute dog cute dog content, don't they? Um, so driving traffic to entertaining content such as blog posts or artist profiles, interactives, that kind of thing, really useful for driving traffic, which can be kind of further signposted to other areas of your site. But it's also important for increasing brand awareness and gaining backlinks as well. So a good example of this was from BFI. They've got a features and review section and it's got plenty of content on it, like film reviews and profiles of notable figures. It's really great content and people link to it in high numbers. So this won't be relevant for everyone, obviously, but if you do have the opportunity to provide kind of an entertaining twist on your subject matter, it is a good opportunity to drive SEO value. And so those were the main themes that I want to pull out from the new four new sectors, but also the sectors overall. And really the thing that I would like to take the opportunity to encourage you to do now is play SEO Super Trumps. Maybe not right this minute, maybe after, um, but please do go on the website, play, play the cards, read the sector reports, um, have a look at those and do send us any questions if you have any or any feedback. And the last thing I'd like to just draw your attention to is that you can book um, a free 30 minute call um, with one of our SEO specialists. So there's a little form at the bottom of um, the website, like sign up. We'd love to talk to you and bring any SEO questions or any problems, any SEO problems that you have. We'd be happy to um, chat with you further in the future. So now we're at the point in the webinar where we're going to I'm going to hand over to our specialists, Nick and Jess, who are going to talk us through the rest of our agenda for today. Um, starting with EE80. Thanks, Emma. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, the first thing that we're going to talk about is EAT. Uh, so Google, as Emma said earlier, Google introduced a new E for experience late last year. I'm going to run through what that is and what it means for your charity um, and then give an overview of it, of EAT as a whole and how you can demonstrate it on your site. So what is EAT? So it stands for expertise, um, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And um, as I said, Google updated EAT in December 2022 to add in experience, um, which means that it's now important to Google that you're demonstrating first-hand experience of your service users on your site. Um, it's not a ranking factor, but it's a set of guidelines to help you create content which can help you to improve your trustworthiness to Google. And then this can result in better organic performance. So trust is the most critical part of EAT, um, as Google says that untrustworthy pages will have low EAT, no matter how experienced, um, expert or authoritative they may seem. I'm now going to run through some of the ways that we can you can demonstrate first-hand experience of users, show that you're an expert in your field, and that you've got the authority to speak on topics that are related to your charity. So within the Super Trumps project, one of the common themes was um, from the sector reports was the extent to which charities are demonstrating experience on their sites. So the homelessness sector was particularly strong for this, with a number of the charities having real life stories pages, as Emma mentioned earlier. Um, so the, these pages support the experience part as their de of, of EAT as a whole, as, their detail, as they detail experiences of people that have been supported by the charity. And um, we found that these charities, um, so homelessness charities, are performing well for keywords that are related to th um, things like real homeless stories. And thinking beyond the homelessness sector, whilst this type of content won't always be targeting specific keywords, it can help, um, help to support the overall demonstration of experience on your website. So how are other charities demonstrating experience? So within the disability sector report, we've pulled out an example from the National Autistic Society, where they're embedding real life experience of autistic women onto their autism and women page. And this is ranking really well for keywords that are related to that topic. 
It's a really strong, strong example of how to integrate real life experience onto the page. So when you're creating or optimizing content for search, consider how you can integrate examples of lived experience onto a page. Things like including quotes from real people is a great way to show to Google that your charity is directly supporting its service users. And it's also important to build trust with prospective donors and future service users as well. So where should you be demonstrating experience? So having real life stories sections on your website, this content might not be generating visits from organic search, but it's helping to signal experience for the website as a whole. Um, support, advice and informational pages. So consider whether you've got pages which would benefit from adding voices of real people that your charity is supporting, or should the content in fact actually be authored in full by people with lived experience? and donate pages as well. So quotes from real people who have been helped by your charity can help to build trust and it could increase intent to donate as well. So demonstrating EAT is particularly important for what Google calls YMYL content. And that stands for your money or your life. Um, and it's content which could impact a person's happiness, health, uh, financial stability or their safety. Um, and when you're providing advice and support for financial matters or um, health conditions, then you need to be demonstrating high levels of EAT on your site. So we've talked about experience, but how do you demonstrate EAT more generally? I'm going to run through some of the ways you can do this now. So a key way of demonstrating experience and authoritativeness is by using expert authors to write or at least contribute to the content on your website. So highlighting authorship is key to demonstrating your experience, your expertise. So ideally content should be written, um, authored, or at least signed off by experts. And often we find that charities are actually doing this, but they're not necessarily saying it on their website. Um, so you should outline who's written the content on web pages and then link out to author biographies. And these biographies should include things like the author's experience and the awards and uh, qualifications and awards that they have. You can also add um, something called person schema to these author biographies. So schema or structured data, as it's sometimes called, can be added to web pages to improve the way that search engines are reading and understanding your content. And by marking up your pages with this type of schema, you're providing Google with detailed information about who the author is and why they're credible. So Google says that um, financial or medical advice needs to be maintained, reviewed and updated regularly. So we've worked with clients to introduce a content review process um, to ensure that content's being kept up to date and that users are able to see when that content has been reviewed and um, when it will be next reviewed because users want to see the most up-to-date content. So by clearly indicating when it was updated, then you can build trust with visitors to your website. And the last one that I want to run through um, is about uh, being transparent with your users about how your donations are being spent. So people want to know where their money's going um, and therefore we'd recommend clearly signposting this information um, on a specific page, something, something like how we spend your money and linking to it clearly, so potentially from the footer navigation of the site. Um, and by doing this, you're improving trust for users, as well as demonstrating that you're uh, trustworthy to Google. So to sum up, um, experience was added as a key factor in December last year. Uh, you need to consider how you're demonstrating experience. So do you have real life stories content? Um, do your key pages contain quotes from people that have been helped by your charity? It's particularly important um, for the nonprofit sector. So, um, because often we're providing information related to people's health, their financial um, stability or their safety. Um, we've outlined a few ways that um, you can demonstrate EAT on your website, including things like author profiles, regularly updating your content and being transparent about your where your donations are being spent. Sorry, I just need to unmute myself there. Um, great, so um, the next section, we're gonna be talking about getting buy-in for SEO in 2023. And no one right now needs reminding that times are quite hard for everyone. Um, and in this current climate where our audiences are feeling the pinch because of the cost of living crisis, we might be finding that our budgets are being under more scrutiny as well. 
Um, so we want to talk a little bit about how we can be persuading budget holders to buy into SEO. So a website called Insider Intelligence conducted a market-wide poll and found that 30% of organisations polled said that they would be reducing their marketing budgets in 2023. 40% um, of people or organisations said that they would be remaining the same. But what was really interesting was that 75% of respondents said that their budgets are under heavy scrutiny, um, even if they're not planning, a, a currently planning a reduction. So with this new financial year coming up, you might be finding the same at your organisation as well. Um, so before this webinar, we sent out a quick poll um, to kind of mimicking the questions from that, because that survey was you know, covering commercial um, and for-profit organizations. So we wanted to just stress test that against the nonprofit sector. And we found that 66% of your market bu marketing budgets are under heavy scrutiny as well, which matches what was found in the insider intelligence report. Um, the majority of you were also saying that your marketing and SEO budgets are remaining the same this year, which is really good to see. Um, but being that this is the nonprofit sector, we all know that budgets are tight. And so in this current climate, um, we feel like it's still important to demonstrate the value of SEO to maintain that buy-in um, by tying SEO into real world objectives and using real world language. And so over the course of this section, we're going to talk about how you can make sure that SEO is getting buy-in at your organization. So we feel like the first thing that you need to do is prove the value of SEO. And so the first step to doing that is basically finding out from your budget holders what the most important things are from an organizational perspective. So the chances are that you already know the answer to this question already because you're, you're there, you're in the charity every day working on this. But for this exercise to be effective, you really need to engage with them and hear it directly from them. Um, and hopefully you'll see why in a moment. So let's start by running through an example for a homelessness charity. So in this table, you can see that I've laid out three priorities. So users at risk of homelessness, finding support, users experiencing homelessness, finding a shelter, and users at risk of eviction and knowing what to do. So once you have these three priorities, then you need to map them to their conversion pages or their main landing pages. So in this, you can see, uh, I've linked it to the Get Help page, the Homeless Shelter Finder, and the Eviction Advice page. And then once you know what pages are linked to those priorities, you can then map these to their um, top search volume keywords. And so in this table, you can see where I've done that for each page. Then once you have all of these all in one table, then you need to find out where your site is ranking compared to one of your direct competitors. So we often find that if there's one thing that can really get someone's attention, it's pointing out how competitors are doing something better than you. Um, so if you can take all the priorities, the URLs, the keywords, and then the rankings, use a ranking table like this. Um, it's a really simple visual, but it can be a really compelling way to spark some interest from your budget holders by simply just benchmarking yourself against your competitors. And that's essentially what this Super Trumps project was. You know, benchmarking was really at the core of what we were doing here. And we did that across a large number of charities from all different sectors. But this could be replicated on a smaller scale, you know, using your most important direct competitors and using the metrics that really help you to make that case that you're trying to prove. You could be trying to work on your page speed. So you would use the core Web vital score. Or perhaps you're trying to invest in some activity to build your authority. Well, then you could use domain authority. Everything that we've included in the metrics on these Super Trump projects, it was all publicly available data. Um, we've, we, we personally, we used uh, Hrefs and we used our crawler Screaming Frog, uh, as well as Google PageSpeed Insights, the, the free tool from Google. But you know, all of the tools um, out there are able to provide a lot of this information. You know, there's other tools such as SEMrush, Majestic. Um, and all of the tools, basically, they, um, they have a free trial, so you can sign up for a month or however long and just play around with the tool before you buy it. So you, will, you are able to find all this data yourself as well. And this type of data can really demonstrate the real world implications of not focusing on SEO when your competitors are. So once you've benchmarked and kind of proved the need for it, then another thing you need to do is to communicate with your stakeholders in a language that they understand. And what you really want to be doing here is linking conversions, aka you know, value, to organic search as a channel. 
if you can show that organic is helping to convert, then budget holders might be more willing to provide budget. So ways that you can do this is by saying 60% of our newsletter signups come from organic search or 56% of our donations come from organic search. And with a bit more investment, that number could increase. Um, we often see with a lot of our clients that organic is the main channel that converts. So, you know, you, it's often a surprise as well when people find that out. So it's important to show this to them too. And you're really likely to grab their attention as well, especially if these percentages are big. And another thing to try and do is avoid jargon. So in SEO, there is a lot of jargon um, and it's really easy to alienate people when you're using terms like indexable or canonical, especially if they just don't know what that means. So when you're communicating, try and change your language so that it's a bit more accessible. So an example of this could be the support page isn't indexed. So instead of saying that, you could say, our users can't get support right now from organic search. It's these small adjustments to language that can make all the difference when it comes to communicating about SEO and getting that buy-in. And don't just focus on tidying up either. Um, at Torchbox, we have coined the phrase impact SEO, and it's a mantra that we really live by. Um, it's really easy to fall into the trap of using SEO resources on tidying up, um, you know, trying to find those smaller issues that are really easy to fix, but actually won't really have that much impact, rather than focusing on the things that really will have the biggest impact. Is your objective to increase awareness for um, your specific type of cancer that you, you support people with, or maybe improve the amount of increase the amount of donations you're getting, or maybe increasing signups to your service? You know, think about how organic search will contribute to those objectives. And then when you're doing that, focus on the bigger picture when it is when it comes to making the case for SEO. Um, and this way you can really get the most value when it comes to reporting back to your senior stakeholders on performance. And that final point that I just mentioned about reporting, that's another really important one. Um, reporting back to these stakeholders and budget holders on positive results, I feel is really the final piece to this puzzle. Um, by shouting about great SEO results, you're creating this positive feedback loop that means that your stakeholders are more likely to understand and continue to invest in SEO. Um, common touch points for this could be sharing a dashboard. Uh, it could be in an organization-wide meeting. It could be in a one-to-one, -one, or it could just be in person, passing in the corridor, anything. Just make sure that people know what's going on in, the SEO, in your SEO world at the moment. So to round off this section, I just wanted to quickly run through the key takeaways again. So to really um, get buy-in for SEO, you want to basically find out what your top priorities are. You want to then map them to those converting pages with their keywords, um, benchmark them against your competitors, whether that's using rankings or using domain authority or core vital um, score, whatever it is, um, men communicate in a language that they understand. So don't alienate them with jargon. Focus on that most impactful work, think impact SEO, um, and then don't forget to shout about it as well. So make sure that everyone knows when something's gone well and make sure that they know that SEO is there. Nick, before you move on, we've got a question for you. Can I jump in? Oh, God. Yeah, sure. Go <laughs> Hope it's not hard. OK, so referring to your impact SEO slide, okay. how, yeah. can, how can we know what are the most important things to prioritize in the in the first place? Yeah. Good question. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. How do you know which to prioritize? So I think what I would say is try to focus on either or of these so either reach or conversions or both you know but think about what 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 is going to increase your reach or try and think about what will increase your conversions and so if I was to go back to that table before the homelessness where the one of with the priorities one of the priorities was um one of the priority pages was the homeless advice page um so if I was to you know say say that was a known priority I want to promote that page you know, how could I do that? Okay, well, maybe you could develop the content offering on that page, make it more relevant, more useful, maybe develop the EAT that Jess talks about, you know, build a content hub uh, around that page and basically work to try and improve the visibility of that page itself. Um, so yeah, just to, just to summarize, 
focus on what you want to increase reach or conversions for basically. I'd also jump hit, jump in here and say that um, I'd recommend looking at the kind of quick wins. So if you're already performing quite well for a keyword, say maybe third or fourth position, um, and you can see that a chari uh, competitor charity is ranking above you, then that could be a good place to start. So look at why they're performing well, maybe what they've got on their page that you don't have, and then try to replicate that. Um, and you can, you'll probably see improvements there. Um, and it can just be a better way to sort of um, a better use of your resources because um, because you're already doing quite well. If you're if you're not really performing very well um, already or you're not performing at all, then there's going to be it's going to be more resource intensive to get ranking for that keyword than it would be if um, you're already doing quite well. Cool. I hope that answers your question. Whoever uh, asked it. Um, cool. Thanks for that input as well, Jess. Um, cool. So, right. Next section. So our next section is all about embedding SEO into your existing processes. So what we're trying to achieve here is to get your organization to see SEO as a necessary part of what you're already doing, rather than seeing it as this kind of separate thing that happens alongside it. And when this happens, we see the, it's when our clients basically see the most success. So we get asked this question a lot by our clients. And like I said, you know, we see the best results when organizations are really actively working to embed SEO into their processes. Um, and it's really at the heart of a lot of our proposals now when we send them out as well, because we really, really believe that the best results come from SEO when you move away from this kind of box ticking attitudes um, and really integrate SEO into your, organ your organization's mindset. And we feel like the best first step to doing this is about demystifying SEO at your organization. So I often find that people have had bad experiences with SEOs in the past where they've dealt with SEOs who kind of treat it like this dark art, using all this jargon and lingo to make it seem a lot more complicated than it actually is, and that you really need them and you need to keep spending money with them, otherwise everything's going to be lost. Um, and at Torchbox, we really actively work to demystify SEO and just make sure that everybody understands what's being talked about and why it's important. Um, this is something that you can do too at your organization, you know, passing that SEO uh, knowledge to the people, passing on that knowledge to the people um, that you're working with, you know, explaining what things mean in an accessible language and explaining why they're important and why you, you need to be working on them. This then starts to filter back through your organization as well. Um, we find that as our primary contacts get upskilled in SEO, they're able to pass that knowledge on into their organizations and make sure that the wider teams are able, um, know what's going on and why it's important and why we're working on the things that we're working on. And then once it's demystified, you know, hopefully everyone knows what's going on, why we're working on it, then you need to promote it. And this is, you know, I mentioned this in the last section, but I'm going to kind of talk about it a bit more now as well. Um, you know, hopefully once you demystify it, SEO is not seen as this confusing channel anymore. So now you need to just try and make sure that your stakeholders know it's there and know that it's not going away and it is going to still keep being important. And there's various touch points that you can use to do this. And I'm just going to run over them a little bit in the next few slides. So. SEO affects everyone. Um, you may have a core SEO team who are meeting up regularly, talking about SEO at your organization. Um, and that you know, should hopefully or may consist of your website lead, your content leads, and your digital marketing person as well. Um, but not only that, you really need to be meeting semi-regularly with your non-SEO colleagues as well. So you want to try and find out what's important to them, make sure they're feeling included and heard, um, this is a really important touch point to make sure these people who may not usually be thinking about SEO start to think about SEO. Uh, I've named a few roles here um, that you might not traditionally associate with SEO, you know, maybe events or fundraising um, policy. Um, but yeah, have a think about who this could be at your organization. And really, in actual fact, it pr probably is almost everyone, you know everybody is affected by the organic performance of your website. Um, and if you can regularly be meeting up with all these people, 
then suddenly they will be um, a lot more interested in SEO and that will just spread like more widely through your organization as well. We work with the NHS and we work really hard to embed SEO there. Um, we are regularly meeting with service designers, user experience researchers, policy people, tech leads, you know, all of these non-traditional, you know, SEO roles. Um, and we're communicating with them about SEO, you know, all across the organization. So everybody knows what's going on. Um, and this has really worked to get all sorts of people thinking about how SEO can support their aspects of the organization. And again, shout about it. You know, I referenced this in the last section, but it's equally as important here too. You know, if you're shouting about these good results, then people who don't usually think about SEO might start thinking about how SEO could impact their specific part of the organization. You know, this could be an all hands, in a one-to-one, -one, in person, just make sure that you're being heard. And again, to draw on that NHS example, you know, we're regularly presenting in their weekly show and tells, which are these kind of lunchtime sessions where people share about what they've been doing. And they're attended by over 100 people from across the organization. So we talk about interesting case studies, good results, and we find that it really helps to get people thinking about how SEO can support them. Training as well. Training is a really easy way to upskill a large number of people in why SEO is important. Um, we regularly run workshops with our clients, including contacts from across the organization. Um, but you could do this too. You know, you could run a training session yourself to promote SEO within your organization. This could be a lunch and learn. It could be um, in a, a team meeting, like just tagged onto the end of a team meeting. Um, engaging with these clients, uh, contacts, sorry, who don't usually think about SEO is just another touch point that you can have to make sure that SEO is being considered. One thing to just say though, is that all of these points are quite specific to managing internal relationships. Um, we've also seen a lot of success when it comes to embedding SEO into the content process as well. So if we were to specifically look about how you can do this with content, we'd recommend some of the following tactics, um, you know, ensuring that SEO is factored into the content calendar rather than being led solely by other parts of the organization. Uh, ensuring that SEO analysis and optimizations are factored into any content review processes that you might have. Uh, this is particularly relevant for the medical and health charities, um, which have, you know, have to regularly be updating their con um, content. Um, and then finally, with your upload checklist as well. So maybe you have an upload checklist. If you don't, I'd recommend creating one. Um, but whenever content is added to the site, making sure that it's optimized at the source when it's uploaded. So, you know, including it, recommendations about how to um, update the title tag, meta description, you know, H1, H2, any important keywords that you should be using. Um, great. So that concludes that section. Um, so a really, really quick reminder of what we covered, uh, and then we're going to move on to just to talk about the cost of living crisis. So um, you want to start by demystifying SEO at your organization. You want to promote it internally. Um, and then we talked about some of the key touch points within your organization that you can do that. Uh, and then we want to factor in SEO into your content creation process as well. Thanks. And that last point around content creation is a great segue into this. Um, so we're going to talk about um, whether or not your charity should be creating content for the cost of living crisis. So <clears throat> the cost of living crisis is everywhere. Um, it's unavoidable and it is impacting almost everyone. So the, N uh, the ONS found that 92% of adults had reported that their cost of living had increased with it with, um, a year ago. Um, so it's likely to be impacting your service users in some way, but do you need to be writing about it? So we recently put together a blog post where we've reviewed the top 100 charities from a YouGov poll, um, and we found that many aren't actually addressing the cost of living crisis, or if they are, they're not highlighting it on their homepages. So out of the 100 charities that we researched, 76 don't directly reference um, cost of living on their homepages. So a lot of charities have been approaching us to um, ask whether or not they should be writing about it. So um, we thought we should provide our thoughts on this. So these are screenshots of the Google results page for the keyword help with the cost of living crisis. So it's a um, it's a mix of government sites and charity pages. And the charities that are ranking at the top are Citizens Advice and Turn to Us. And these are charities that are supporting people directly with their finances. 
There are other charities um, that are appearing and these sit within different sectors. So from supporting older people, supporting single parents and supporting those facing homelessness. Um, so this does suggest that creating content which outlines the support that's available for people through the crisis could be valuable to your charity's users. Even if you're not directly providing support, um, then there is an opportunity to create content which points people to the support that they may need. Um, so you might benefit from organic traffic here, but the key is that you're providing users with advice, whether or not they land um, on your page from organic search or they navigate to that content from your website. So um, we've also been working on some blog content which explores how people are searching for the cost of living crisis. And we found that there is significant search volume for keywords which mention it, um, but the results for these keywords are typically dominated by government sites and news publications um, who have the authority to speak directly about the crisis. So therefore, if you spend resource writing content which is specifically about the, the crisis, such as what it is, when it will end and what the solutions are, then it's unlikely that you're going to perform well organically um, and it won't necessarily be providing your service users with the support they actually need. So we see that the biggest opportunities for charities at this time is to really consider the specific ways that um, the increased cost of living is impacting your service users. So as a few examples, if you're a charity operating in the homelessness sector, then your audience might be struggling to pay their rent and they might be at risk of homelessness. Um, if you're a charity in the violence against women and girls sector, then your audience might be at risk of domestic abuse due to financial pressures that have been exacerbated by the crisis. If you're within the arts and culture sector, um, then the increased cost of living might, might have reduced your audience's disposable income. And if you're a charity that supports people with disabilities, then your audience might be struggling with rising costs and they might be looking for information about the government help that's available. So people are being impacted differently and you'll know about the range of ways that your service users are being affected. Um, so it's really important that you're providing support and advice to your users if they're struggling with rising costs. But how can this be directly related to the cost of living crisis? Well, people that are impacted might not specify this within their search. So for example, if you're struggling with food costs, then would you search struggling with food costs due to the cost of living crisis? Or would you just search food bank near me? People don't need to explain why they're experiencing what they're experiencing. They just want to find support. So what we'd recommend doing is carrying out keyword research, which will help you understand how people that would use your service are looking for the support they need and ensuring that you've got that content on your site, which is targeting those specific keywords and offering people with the support that they need. So we've done some keyword research and found some, some examples of considerable year on year increases for things like help with energy bills, which has gone up 890% in a year. Um, food bank near me is up 50% year on year. Also things like mental health support, that's up 22%. And even things like rehome my dog, which is up 48% year on year. So none of these keywords are directly referencing the cost of living crisis, but they do indicate some of the ways that the increase in the cost of living might have impacted how people are searching. So this is an example of where a charity has content which is acknowledging the cost of living crisis, but it's optimized for terms which don't specifically relate to it. So Age UK are ranking first for the keyword help with pension, help for pensioners with rising with energy bills. Um, and the page is discussing the, the increased cost of living. It includes last updated date, which was very recent. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, that links with the kind of EAT principle. Um, and it signals to Google and to users that ch the charity is maintaining this content um, and providing up to date information, which could be why it's ranking so well. So just to sum up then, um, the cost of living crisis is impacting almost everyone and your service users will most likely be being impacted in different ways. Um, we'd recommend that you, you conduct keyword research, which will help you understand how your audiences are conveying their worries and struggles um, and searching for the information and support that they need. And this will help you to focus on ensuring that the content that you've got or that you need is going to be optimised to directly address the ways that people are searching um, for help that's been um, due to the issues that have been exacerbated by the crisis. 
because this is probably a better way to address people's needs and convey the unique value that your charity has to offer. Keep this content up to date and if it's appropriate, acknowledge the cost of living crisis within the content as well. And finally, um, I've mentioned that we've been working on some blog content about this and Lisa's going to follow up with this up after the webinar. Thanks, Jess. Thank We're now in the questions section of the webinar. Um, we've got a little bit of time, have we, Lisa? Yes, we have. We've got plenty of time for questions. So if anyone's got any more. Um, also, I think that, Emma, you could ask um, Mike's one. I think yes. in case anybody's missed the answers that have been coming through on the Q&A as well, then we could actually ask some of those live so that everybody can hear the answers to those. Yes, absolutely. Should we do that now? We'll do Mike's question, which... Oh, sorry, I answered it <laughs> too hastily. Um, <laughs> but Jess did speak about um, accessibility recently. Um, the Brighton SEO, yeah. you, you may want to add about this, Jess. Um, yeah. The question is, is accessibility a ranking or EEAT factor at all? Or just best practice to help UX? Thinking about strengthening buy-in here. And my answer that is, uh, was just that accessibility isn't confirmed directly as a ranking factor by Google, um, but obviously it's super important for a good user experience um, overall. Did you want to add to that, Jess? Yeah, um, so a lot of the work that we've done is around the intersection between SEO and accessibility. So a lot, a lot of the time when we're talking about SEO best practice, we're also talking about accessibility best practice so I guess if you if you want to see it in that way then it is a ranking factor because it's tied with um, SEO best practice also um, Google does measure accessibility in its page speed insights so it gives you an accessibility score um, so it would be yeah really interesting I guess to look at your website through that and see how you're performing it doesn't measure all accessibility criteria but it does measure some of them. So um, yeah, so it will give you a score. So that's a, kind of a good place to start, I guess, if you're poking into um, how good your website's accessibility is. Brilliant. Thank you, Jess. So if there aren't, I don't think there are any more questions. So I will just say thank you, everybody, for coming. And I will send a follow up. Oh, we've got one. Hold on, Laura. <laughs> um, I'll just say this bit now anyway, but um, I'm going to be sending a um, follow up email, which will have a link to Supertrans. Um, and I'll also list any of the other tools and things that we've been referencing throughout the webinar and send a link to the slides as well. So that can come after. But there are more questions coming in now, Ems, so we can go through those. Yeah. <laughs> yes. OK, um, so we'll start with um, Laura. Maybe a silly question. There are no silly questions, Laura. We don't believe in silly questions in around here. Um, but how is Google working out the expert blogs and real life stories, etc., are there? Do we need to be using specific phrases, real life stories and expert, etc.? Good question. Anybody want to add? Um, I would say that having what we've seen with the homelessness sector works quite well, where they do have kind of sections of their website where they have real homeless stories or, you know, um, and it could apply to other sectors as well. Um, and I would say it suggests kind of using that phrasing um, in terms of expert blogs. I think I think the key is having um, authorship information so that and that is clearly kind of indicating that you're using credible authors um so yeah so having authorship even if if you know if it's if you don't have um pages for those authors just having a little bit of content on the on the blog um or the content that they've written about who they are um is is what i'd suggest not sure if anyone else has got any thoughts there yeah i just just to add to the authorship question um you know, having those authorship pages is really important and linking, make you know, linking to the organizations that they're affiliated with. So, you know, often in the medical sector, authors are, are backed up, they're affiliated with medical colleges or things like that, or maybe they've won, you know, fellowships or whatever, you know, things like that. And linking to those organizations and those specifically those organizational pages where they're, they're um, accredited um and that way you've kind of got this cross-linking thing and then that way google's like okay well they say that they're affiliated here oh they are and they link back from here as well um and i you know i hate to give a non-charity example but whenever i'm giving uh examples of who's doing this really well it's actually healthline um healthline are really good at their authorship information so 
you know, next time, if you want to see a good example of it, just look at any condition page on Healthline and you'll be able to see what they're doing. Definitely. I think the question there around like how Google works it out is that I guess Google is a bit of a mystery to us in that how it exactly works out. But where the concept of EEAT comes from is actually from Google's um, search quality raters guidelines. And what that means is that there are real people that Google employs to assess the quality of results. And those people don't rank pages. So there's no there's not somebody sitting in their house going, well, we'll rank you above this one. But what they do do on mass is search for certain queries and then look at the results and see whether the user's needs have been met in a number of ways. And within those quality raters guidelines, it goes in depth, in great depth about EEAT and all of the different ways in which that can be demonstrated. Um, so we know that Google somehow um, is factoring all of that information back into the algorithms. Um, and I would highly recommend if you haven't looked at it, it is quite long, but if you're interested in just sort of like how it works, the quality raters guidelines is a really, really good place to start. Um, so if you just Google that, you'll be able to find it and we, you know, I'll send it to you in the chat, but a good place to start about how Google is actually sort of working behind the scenes. Um, another question we've got, Jen Clayton, are there any key differences to watch out for with other search engines, e.g. Bing? Um, I can start with that if you want, Nick. Yeah, I've, also, I've also got a stance on that. So, Go on yeah. then. Um, so it's, it's, this is always a difficult question whenever it comes up because people are obviously always want to know about Bing as well. Um, in general, we we tend to optimize mainly for Google because Google has about 90% of the search market share. Um, Bing's um, market share is increasing slowly over time, but you know um, we we work in the nonprofit sector. You know, no one you know we don't have mega budgets like um, like some for profit or commercial sites or e-com sites. So I would say, you know, given the context of our situations, really the best thing to be doing is just focusing on Google, given that 90% market share. Um, you yeah, know, I've worked yeah. in the commercial sector before, Bing, Yandex, they were all part of our strategies. But yeah, in this, in this sector, it's just really, I'd say, just focus impact SEO, you know, like I talked about earlier, really focus on the things that will bring the most impact. The other thing to obviously mention there is obviously the AI link with Bing. Um, and what I would say is just that the one key difference is super quick win really is that obviously there is Bing webmaster tools and we find that like 90% of the charities that we work with don't have it. Um, so if you don't have a Bing webmaster tools, which is the equivalent of Google search console, sign up for that. And that will give you, it's essentially the same. It's very, very similar in what's in there. And it's a quick win because then you can get an idea about what's going on in Bing. Um, and you can do things like submit your sitemaps to Bing and all the things that you would do in Google search console. Um, so I'd start with that. And then as we see how the AI in Bing plays out, we'll give you some more advice. Look out for our AI webinar. <laughs> um, another one we've got there is the cost of living. Have we got time, Lisa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my answer, Evie's, and then Nick's answering the other one in type. Good stuff. Is the cost of living crisis just a quick content opportunity instead of being a thought leader in within X charity sector? Thoughts on a local cancer charity doing this um so does anybody have any thoughts on that I do you mean that it'd be a quick content up a quick blog post it'd be good to sort of say something about having a stance on it evie if you could just give us a bit more info we would love that <laughs> i don't know if you want to add jess yeah i think um i guess it sort of links back to what we were what we were saying around um, thinking about how your users are being impacted by the cost of living crisis so you don't necessarily need to write a page about it um, but just have some you know maybe reference it um, and make sure you've got content which is um, related to how you're supporting people um, which is optimized in a way that will um, reflect how people are looking for the support that they need so um, and I'd suggest starting by doing some research to find out how people are looking for the help that they need um, which is specific to your question um, got your your charity sorry yeah and I would say like in terms of a quick content opportunity if if you're get, if you're gaining traffic to your site from other channels that isn't organic search or you're gaining branded traffic to your homepage and you want to 
um, provide the content so that you've got a stance on it and people can click through to it from your homepage or you could direct people to it from, let's say, um, social media or another channel, then definitely do, you know, definitely do it. But, but where we've talked about it today is really like if you want to actually rank for specific terms and drive traffic from organic search relating to the cost of living crisis, that will be the way to do it. But if you want to put out some comms about your approach and what it means for, for, for users and you're going to drive traffic to that content from another channel or through your branded traffic or through your homepage, then obviously that would be great to do. And a lot of charities are doing that. Um, but it's more we, we get asked the question like, should I be trying to rank for cost of living crisis is, is the question that we've been asked a lot. And I think the answer is generally no, but there are lots of other things that you could be trying to rank for that are related. And there will be a link to the cost of living blog in the follow-up email as well, which is answering some of those questions too. Okay, we've just got one more that we're going to squeeze really? in before we go. Yeah, I'm going to squeeze in the final question, which is about, do you notice the difference in the data in accuracy between HRFs and MOZ? Well, um, I would say that there is probably like an 80% overlap between the data and those two platforms, um, you know, between those two platforms. We have both uh, to Torchbox. I think really they they are, they have different, they have different strengths, let's say. I think Ahrefs is better for keywords and content research. I think Moz is maybe slightly better for backlinks. But I think the key thing to say is that that 80% overlap covers the, the more important 80% of the information let's say so you know the, the the difference might be in those really tiny random blogs or spam sites those types of things but like the really critical information is contained within that 80 percent overlap and i think that's why you'd probably be safe if you know if you had to pick one tool over the other you know you'd be safe with either if i'm honest so Brilliant. I think that's it. We got through all the questions, I think, in the end. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, and I will send you all an email and just keep an eye on our um, LinkedIn and Twitter for future events as well. I hope to see you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see Bye. you.